So first of all, um, I would like to uh, start talking about the, the leadership of the physical oceanography team. Um, so Zhuzhen Davis has been a part of the physical oceanography team from the, from the beginning, um, a couple of years ago when we started the physical oceanography team. Um, and she has been instrumental in, uh, in getting us going. Uh, but she decided to, to step down. Um, but, and we really like to thank her again for, uh, for the work that she's done on getting the, the physical oceanography team uh, started. Um, so with that, we found um, a, a replacement. We found a new uh, co-lead of the physical oceanography team. And we are very, very pleased to have uh, Jen Lee uh, from Bohem on the, on the team. Um, she kindly agreed to, to be co-leading this team. Um, Jen, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you for your introduction. Yeah, I'd be very happy to join uh, this team. Um, I'm a member of uh, IRPIC uh, for a while, but uh, this is my first time to be the co-lead of uh, physical oceanographer um, collaboration team. My background is uh, I have uh, uh, physical oceanography uh, trainings, and uh, I'm currently work with um, Home, uh, oil spill modeling and also manage uh, that uh, it, uh, many projects for oil spill modeling and physical oceanography research and other re uh, related research at the BOM. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jan. Um, yeah, we're very excited. Also, with our affiliation um, at, at BOM, um, it really prepares the team well, I think, for the, for the transition to, the, to the, the next phase of the research plan. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started with the meeting. Uh, so this is the September meeting of the Physical Oceanography team for IARPIC. Um, as you're I'm probably aware, IARPIC is the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee uh, that brings together leaders from 18 agencies, departments, and offices across the United States federal government uh, to enhance collaboration on research in the Arctic. Um, and IARPIC Collaborations is the public branch of IARPIC. Uh, that aims to facilitate uh, interaction and collaboration again across the, the interagency spectrum. Um, so IARPIC released its, its current research plan 2022 to 2026 uh, last year, um, and it's currently developing its first biannual implementation plan that is scheduled for release in, in November. Um, so the Physical Oceanography Collaboration Team is, is, aims to coordinate research of the physical oceanography of the, of the Arctic Ocean and also facilitate um, the sharing of, of information. Uh, so today, <clears throat> we'll be talking about tidal energy in the Arctic. Um, tides play an important role um, in the Arctic, not just in shaping the physical system, uh, but also as a potential source um, of energy. Um, we are very pleased to have two uh, distinguished speakers. Um, so the first speaker that we have is Till, Till Bauman. He's a, a postdoc at the University of, of Bergen. Um, he got his PhD in 2019 at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, studying with uh, Igor Polyakov. Um, so his talk is uh, titled, The Small Force to be Reckoned With, How Tides Shape the Arctic Ocean. So we'll get started. Uh, so we have two speakers. They have 15 minutes each. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes um, for clarifying questions after each uh, presentation. Uh, and then at the end, I hope we'll have more time for, uh, for a deeper discussion. Um, so, Till, do you want to share your screen? Yeah. All right. And just to, uh, to clarify, Till's in, at the University of Bergen. He's in, in, in Norway right now. It's very late. Um, for Levy, our second speaker, it's very early. So we kind of span uh, the entire uh, the time range here. So um, yeah, take it away, Till, when, when you're ready. Yeah, thanks uh, very much for this introduction. Uh, yeah, as I said before, I'm Till Baumann, and I'm affiliated here with the University of Bergen and the Bjergne Center for Climate Research. I'm doing a postdoc uh, with Ilka Fair, focused on mixing processes in the Arctic. And yeah, my title uh, is a small force to be reckoned with, how tides shape the Arctic Ocean. Uh, I probably won't cover all of the ways tides sh uh, shape the Arctic Ocean, but uh, just to give a taste. Um, and just so that we are all on the same page, just some basic background that tides are, of course, created by the sun and the moon. 
and the gravitational forces they exert on the Earth. And in the Arctic, tides are often the dominant source of current variability. That's partly due to the sea ice cover that dampens the wind effect. So tides play an important role. And tidal signals uh, are just not, not just tides, but they can be uh, decomposed into various constituents. So uh, for the semidiurnal tide, the major constituents are the so-called M2, the lunar semidiurnal, and the S2, the solar semidiurnal. But there are many, many more constituents also for diurnal tides that have a period of about 24 hours. Um, the easiest way or the most straightforward way to approach tidal currents <clears throat> are the biotropic tides. Biotropic tidal currents are driven directly by the planetary forces and they depend only on topography. Um, they tend to be strongest over topographic features and shallow shelves. And the nice thing about these biotropic tides is that they're very predictable and they're near constant over time and depth. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and that makes them very easy to model. So below we see um, the result from the inverse model called ARC 5 kilometers 2018 from Eurofeva and Egbert. And this shows just our tropic currents, average for the whole water column uh, over the whole Arctic region. And th there you might see where the small in my title comes from, that over most of the deep Arctic Ocean, our tropic tidal models say basically tides don't exist. It's like they have a current amplitude of 0.5 centimeters per second. They seem to play a bigger role on the shelves, uh, most pronounced here on the uh, Siberian shelf, um, but they're like spotted around. But overall, the amplitudes are not very great. However, biotropic tides don't capture the whole tidal story. We, of course, also have bioclinic tidal currents. Bioclinic, bioclinic tidal currents are created when biotropic tides flow over rough topography and they propagate as internal waves. And below it's just a nice visualization of how one might envision internal waves uh, created at this shelf break. They propagate within the water column. And how they propagate depends on the stratification and background currents, but they can have great amplitudes. But because they depend on all the surrounding parameters, they're very difficult to predict. Um, to complicate the things a bit further, we also have inertial currents. Um, so inertial currents are mostly wind driven and they oscillate at inertial periods, which is the natural period for oscillations on earth. Um, and they, this period depends on the latitude. And this is just an example from a picture from a ship's plotter I did. We were cruising around in the Arctic, uh, looking for an ice flow. And then we found an ice flow, moved the ship to an ice flow, stopped the engines, and the drift that ensued was the spiral pattern. So this is the inertial motion. And unfortunately, in the Arctic, the inertial periods are overlapping with the semi tidal periods. So whenever we measure something, at a period, currents at a period of about 12 hours, it's very difficult to separate uh, what is inertia currents and what is tidal driven. But why would we care about tides in the first place? Um, and I think it all comes down to mixing. And I think it's very nicely illustrated in this sketch from Leonard Al uh, 2021. Um, this shows a host of mixing processes for the Arctic Ocean. And of course, the, the key in the Arctic is that we have this huge reservoir of Atlantic water that's sitting at depth. <clears throat> and that's a huge reservoir of heat. And even very small heat fluxes of the order of one watt per square meter can have a significant influence on the sea ice above. So calculated over a year, one watt per square meter can lead to a reduction of about 10 centimeters of sea ice. And when we look at uh, what is done in these sketches, we see that tidal mixing just at the shelves is uh, 
estimated to be around 10 volts per square meter. Uh, and additionally, we have seen that uh, internal tidal waves are basically internal waves. And this is a, has a long, large range of possible contribution, but one to 10 watts per square meter are possible from internal waves, which admittedly is mostly in inertial, so wind driven, but there might be a tidal contribution to this. So tidal currents are uh, crucial for the Arctic and quantifying them is key to understand how the Arctic will develop. Um, and I'll illustrate this as an example from my PhD work. This was uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks with Igor Polyakov. And there we focus on the Eastern Eurasian Basin, uh, which is north of Siberia here. Um, and there were six moorings across the continental slope uh, from about 250 meters water depth to three and a half kilometers. They were deployed for two years between 2013 and 2015, designed to measure temperature, salinity, and currents in the upper thousand meters of the ocean. And as you can see, this goes right across the inflow of the Atlantic water up to the Arctic. Looking at the currents, just the raw current measurements at all the uh, six moorings from the shallowest, M11, to M16, the deepest. Uh, we see there's some seasonality. At the top of each bar, you see this shading. White indicates sea ice cover. Black indicates no sea ice, so the summer. And these are just raw current speeds with their direction. So we have this strong boundary current uh, at the upper slope that we see here. And it gets weaker towards deep ocean. Um, now we want to focus just on the dominant tidal band, the semi-journal band currents. So we take away all the other signals, concentrate only on the semi-journal band. And this, of course, contains tides, but also these wind-driven inertial currents that we can't get rid of. Um, what we see is a lot of vertical stripes. So it's a very stripy image. And these stripes is a, have a period of about 14 days. And that's the spring leap cycle of tidal currents. So wherever we see vertical stripes here, it's a good indication of these actual tidal currents. And I can't go into all of the details here, but the main message to take away is that there's lots of um, variability going on. Currents are very strong. They reach over 20 centimeters a second. They vary in time. They have a seasonal cycle. They vary in depth. And they vary across the, the mooring area. And yeah, having such strong currents, especially here in the middle of the water column at like 90 meters depth, uh, creates big shear and a big potential for mixing. Um, yeah, what we also see is that the tidal variability is connected to the sea ice cycle. So we see that we have this in winter, we have this going down of tidal activity. In summer, it gets shallower at almost all of them. Then we have during summer, these very strong currents, probably mostly due to wind driven inertial currents, but there's also this stripiness to them. So there might be some tidal con contribution as well. And crucially, all of what we see is much more energetic than what the biotropic model would predict. So for the same area, if we look at the biotropic model, it would predict for most of the moorings only negligible tides up to maybe five to max 10 centimeters a, sec uh, a second high up the slope, and we see 20 centimeters a second, and even amplitudes of over 10 centimeters a second where the water depth is over 1,000 meters. So there's a big difference. The question was, is this a special case, or how does it look for the whole Arctic? And this motivated us to uh, assemble the Arctic Tidal Current Atlas. Uh, with lots of co-authors. Um, our rationale was that tides and inertial motions play an important role in a changing Arctic Ocean. And Arctic-wide data is needed for process studies and crucially model validation. We need to figure out if the models capture this uh, variability. We know that there have been tons of observations, but most of them were just scattered around. It's getting better these days, but it was a bigger problem. So our goal was to collect all available data and publish a comprehensive pan-Arctic data set. 
of tidal and inertial currents. And uh, this is what we ended up with. So we collected about 430 records from moored current meters from the last 20 years throughout the whole Arctic. Uh, we collected them from 35 different international sources and institutes. Uh, unfortunately, we, of course, don't cover all of the Arctic. Um, there's still lots of practical issues with the sea ice to deploy new rings in the central Arctic. Uh, but we got a good coverage. And especially after about 2003, we always get about 50 or more records every year uh, throughout the Arctic. Now, what this uh, atlas enables us to do is to look at the spatial, temporal structure and variability of tidal parameters. So as we see here on the right hand side, it's just an example plot where I averaged from all these different clusters, the tidal currents. And we see that to basically all of them, there's a significant vertical structure. So our tropic tidal models would not capture uh, this variability at all. So in most places, there seems to be uh, quite significant biochemicity to it. And so this atlas might help to identify sites of enhanced biochemicity, uh, which is important for mixing processes. Uh, it can also do the assessment of seasonal to interannual variability of tidal currents, and of course, the validation of our clinic tidal models. Uh, some further examples on what uh, this atlas can be used to. Um, we can check uh, the regional importance of tidal currents. How much are they compared to the, um, the raw currents? What we see here, for example, is just an average of all the raw currents on the right-hand side, just in the tidal band. And we see that, for example, around Greenland, Davis Strait, and Baffin Bay, I think, um, basically all of the current uh, activity that is here is the same in the tidal band. So all of the currents that happen there are tides. Um, if we look at the Bering Strait, there's very strong currents. The tides are also directed along the Bering Strait, but they are quite a lot weaker than what we observe. The same here for the Beaufort Sea, um, where we see very strong currents, not so strong tides. Um, furthermore, we have um, prepared different tidal constituents. So if one is only interested in particular tidal con constituents in specific region, one can just look at for instance, N2 or K1, or like look at the ratio of how they, uh, what the composition is of the tides locally. Right, and that's basically just a, a product so that everybody, because we don't have the time to look at the, all the individual records, that everybody has a chance to look in the region where they are interested in. To conclude, um, so we all know that tides play a major role for Arctic Ocean mixing processes. We see here. And bioclinic tidal currents interact with the sea ice and certification and this change over time, which makes them difficult to predict. So there's a big potential for climate and ecosystem changes. And biotropic uh, tidal models do not capture key variability from this tidal action. But we do have uh, Arctic-wide data available to analyze local tidal effects and validate models. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks, thanks so much, Till. This was uh, this was a very useful presentation. Um, very interesting. Um, we have time for maybe uh, one or two questions. If you want to raise your hand, if you have a question. And otherwise, we can also um, transfer it to the discussion uh, later, or maybe to uh, to the chat. If you have it questions, like John Tool has a question. Hey, those, thanks, uh, thanks for the talk, Tool. Um, you did mention the critical attitude for M2 tides. Uh, most of your mooring data seem to be equator word of that. I just wondered if you're getting a biased impression of the importance of tidal mixing compared north and south with that critical attitude. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Sorry, I was wondering if I should include uh, the critical attitude. Uh, most of the mooring data is, in fact, north of the critical attitude. So it's uh, not equator ward. So the critical attitude is south of that. So we see lots of um, all the mooring, so the detailed mooring data that I showed is all 
quite far north of the critical latitude. So this is all on the sharp edge. So it's probably some sort of trapped, uh, trapped type activity going on there. Um, there's also something um, I would like to mention because I'm working on it right now, which I find quite exciting and I didn't have a possibility to put in the talk, um, that we, in other records north of Svalbard, we seem to see uh, higher harmonic generation from the trapped diurnal tide that might propagate and quite energetically and might propagate northwards uh, into the Arctic Ocean. So there's, uh, there's this part of the story as well, which I didn't have time to mention. Great, thanks. Uh, can you clarify what the critical latitude is? Not everybody on this call may be familiar with that. Yes, so that um, internal waves can only exist in a frequency band between F, which is the local Coriolis parameter, and N, which is the uh, certification frequency, basically. So this spans a frequency band in which internal waves can propagate. And um, in the Arctic, the uh, semi tides are outside of this frequency band. So they are too low frequency to propagate freely. So that's why they're trapped to the topography to the, to the shelves. Yeah, the distinction so, is the freely propagating versus trapped to topography and, and basically a topographic wave. What they can, they, they can certainly propagate as a topographic wave, just not as a free wave. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so they can't propagate freely. But, yeah. Are there any more questions? All right, well, maybe we should hand it over to, the, to our second speaker of today. Um, and then uh, any additional questions for Till can be put in the, in the chat, or we can, and we can re revisit it during the discussion uh, session. Um, so we'll uh, hear from Levi Kilcher from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, he's got a PhD in physical oceanography from Oregon State University from 2011, and he will talk about um, marine energy opportunities in Alaska. So this is basically harvesting the, um, the tidal energy that uh, Till was talking about. Feel free to share your screen. All right, is that coming through? Yeah, yeah thanks for is. thanks for that introduction. Um, as uh, I, as I was watching uh, Till's presentation, I was thinking, wow, this is uh, a really contrasting. I'm going to be coming at this from a very different angle. Um, not so much focused on the Arctic, um, but on, so I work at the National Renewable Energy Lab um, and we look at marine energy uh, globally. Um, and so marine energy includes wave and tidal energy. Um, and one of the things that I like to point out for people who are not, uh, as well as other forms of energy, there's ocean current energy, um, ocean thermal energy and others. But I like to point out to people when we start out the, the outsized role that the oceans play in our ecosystems and the global climate and global just systems, you know, we are the blue planet, the Pacific Ocean is as large as the entire landmass of the US or, or of the of the world. Um, uh, Cause I think a lot of people are un unaware of some of those, those details of how, just how large the oceans are. Um, and so one of the parts of my job is to quantify for the Department of Energy and sort of for the country, what those marine, marine energy resources are, how much energy is out there. Um, and so we, we look at this across the, the entire US exclusive economic zone. So that's 200 nautical miles from shore. Uh, and we've conducted sort of high level resource assessments uh, for the whole country. Um, and here you can see there's uh, 2300 terawatt hours per year of energy sort of combined in uh, ocean waves, tides, ocean thermal energy. Uh, we also look at river energy, like the energy and flow, free flowing, free flowing rivers without dams, uh, as well as um, uh, ocean current energy, if I didn't say that already. There's also the, 
We have also quantified the ocean thermal energy resources of US Pacific Island uh, territories and freely associated states. That's these gray circles along the bottom here. Um, and uh, there's a sizable amount of energy in, in that as well. And just to put this in context a little bit, the this 2300 terawatt hours per year number, that's roughly 60% of the total electricity generation of the US. So it's a, it's a huge amount of uh, resource and resource potential, um, but it's, you know, it's also not going to solve all of our energy problems uh, in this country by itself. Um, and compared to resources like uh, offshore wind or wind energy and solar energy, these numbers are actually, you know, relatively small. Um, maybe one tenth of one tenth of the uh, of the wind or solar resource kind of kind of scale. But nonetheless, they are sizable resources. And the thing that I think is really especially interesting about marine energy resources is that Alaska actually has an outsized portion of those resources. Um, almost a half of the total marine energy resources are in Alaska. And we tend to focus on the subarctic portions of Alaska in our assessments, largely just due to the complications of ice. But I'm, there's been a lot of interest in looking at Arctic energy needs and how some of the energy resources that are up there um, could be could be utilized for whatever whatever kind of energy needs there are, and in particular, the De U.S. Department of Energy has launched what they call the Powering the Blue Economy Economy Initiative, and that initiative looks at um, sort of niche markets where um, maybe smaller amounts of power are needed, and what kinds of technologies could deliver that. For example, for ocean sensing, for defense applications. Uh, for, um, and, and then of course you get into all of the sort of ocean engineering uh, uses of energy or applications for uh, mitigating climate change that also I think the Department of Energy sort of powering the blue economy space is potentially interested in. And so I, I'm really excited to be like connected with this community and to talk to, to see Till's presentation because we just, we just don't have a lot of data on the Arctic and I, I'd love to have some answers to more of those questions about what the opportunities are in the Arctic. So recently, um, as I said, the sub Alaska has um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, those resources, and uh, Cook Inlet in particular has about thirty five percent of the nation's tidal energy resource. Um, you know, it's a large tidal basin. Uh, it uh, and the tides in Cook Inlet are very large, and so there's a, a resource of, of approximately 18 gigawatts of power, which is roughly 30 times the the average load of the entire rail belt. So that's all the way from Homer up to Fairbanks. Um, there's there's more than enough energy, and so when you have these situations where you've got more resource available then load, then you start to get into conversations about, well, what could you do with that extra resource if you were tapping into it? And that's where it's sort of interesting that right here at the Forelands where the, where the most sort of energy dense site in the inlet is, uh, here at Kenai, uh, Nikiski area, there's this shuttered ammonia plant um, owned, by the, owned by Nutrien. Um, that had had it in up until I think about 2010, it was exporting urea, but the cost of natural gas in Cook Inlet went up and so they shut down the plant. Uh, but basically the idea that you could repurpose this facility, ammonia is seen as a sort of re potential renewable energy fuel of the future for moving renewable energy or storing in renewable energy. Um, so could you repurpose this plant existing infrastructure uh, to produce ammonia and export that, you know, either to other parts of the state, rural communities around the state, or to the to uh, to other countries, Japan or the the lower 48. Um, so that's like a really interesting piece of this puzzle in Cook Inlet that's been getting a lot of attention with uh, the governor's office and um, and others in the state. So one of the things that I like to point out, or I frequently get asked is like, okay, Levi, people have been talking about tidal energy and Cook Inlet for a long time, uh, why now? And I think the, the answer to that question is that when I started at NREL 10 years ago, 
basically all of these technologies either didn't exist or were in their infancy. And now we're at a stage where there are megawatt scale uh, technologies. Most of those are coming out of Europe. Um, and But also in the US, we're seeing sort of the tens of kilowatts, 100 kilowatt scale devices starting to be proven for a couple of years. Um, and in, in the same in the Europe, most of these technologies have been proven out for a few years. And so where we're really at now is we have technologies that we know can work for short periods of time, but really demonstrating that they can work reliable, reliably for decades at a time and figuring out how to drive down the operations and maintenance costs of those technologies on those timescales so that you can get the costs of these technologies down low enough to be commercially competitive with other sources of you know, renewable sources or other sources of energy generation is really the challenge that we're faced with right now. So that brings me to like sort of the timeline for uh, what I think needs to happen uh, to make these technologies commercial. So we're sort of at this phase now where we're demonstrating uh, proof of concept technologies, dem do doing demonstration projects that demonstrate, have, have proven uh, the viability of these technologies on one to two year timescales. Uh, but the next stage is really to drive down those uh, operations and maintenance costs. And, you know, it's going to be a lot of uh, pain, I think, along the way in terms of the challenges and headaches that we still have to work through with, you know, basically putting these things in the water, putting, putting multiple of these devices in the water, testing them, seeing what breaks, pull them out, fix them, redesign them, um, and so on. And I think that's like a, a 15 to 20 year uh, timeline because, I think ultimately the technologies are commercial when you can you've demonstrated that they can be reliable on those 10 to 20 year time scales and you're not going to get there until you've done that for 10 to 20 years. So uh, we do have some tricks for like accelerating some of the components of uh, testing some of those components on those time scales. Um, but basically, I think to demonstrate to the financial community that this is that this is an economical thing you've got to you've got to prove it. And that's where we're at now. So I've been pushing the idea of, uh, of um, doing some of this work, of doing these long-term demonstration projects. Sometimes they're called pilot projects uh, in Cook Inlet. Um, and then I think where this is going in the bigger scale is uh, um, once we've proven that we have these technologies, that we can make marine energy turbines that generate electricity reliably, then I think you start to get into some really sort of out there ideas. Um, and I've got this picture down here in the lower right hand corner um, that shows it's actually a wind turbine device. So there's a, there's a wind turbine sticking up out of the water that you can't see here, but there's water turbines that are providing a reaction force for the wind turbine. And then if you're producing ammonia uh, or some other renewable fuel on board this uh, this device and storing that fuel somewhere, maybe in the keel of the of the the device, um, then all of a sudden you sort of have a roving what we call a roving wind turbine um, that drives around, captures wind energy from storms wherever uh, wherever it there, the storms seem to be, and then it could potentially deliver that fuel to whatever markets uh, need it. Um, and so that's where I think you sort of get into the blue sky thinking about what's really possible if we can if we can figure out these marine energy technology challenges that we're facing right now um, to address you know the challenges of climate change and, and carbon um, you know there's a lot of challenges and research priorities sort of in the short term to both to commercializing these technologies but also uh, specifically in Cook Inlet um, you know saltwater, is probably the biggest challenge that I, or one of the biggest challenges that um, that I see. Ice in Cook Inlet uh, is a challenge. Uh, there's long permitting timelines, ecosystem risks, and marine mammals, and um, on and on. And so I'm sort of interested in like connecting with this community to understand what you know who's interested in helping us address some of these challenges. Uh, you know, the ice in Cook Inlet challenge is one that. Uh, I'm not an expert in, and so having more people who can who can help me identify um, uh, ways to measure the ice and characterize the ice in a way that's useful for marine energy technologies is uh, is would be one place. Another one is the 
marine mammals and fisheries monitoring. We have some partners that do a lot of work in that space now, but I think it's a space where more brains is going to be useful. Um, and this slide just kind of like lays out uh, a picture of kind of how I think we need to be doing this, designing these technologies. And like I said earlier, it's going to be in this iterative loop of like test, put, testing things, putting in the water, monitoring what's going on. They're going to break. You take that learning to improve your tools and your R&D and to do some innovation. And then you go back to the drawing board and uh, improve your designs and, and go through the loop again. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to say we've been actually working with Hillcorp, which is the uh, oil and gas, the, the major oil and gas company in Cook Inlet, and they have these platforms uh, distributed throughout uh, Cook Inlet. And they're they're really interested in working with us. You know, I think there's pressure from their um, from their leadership as well as you know the public sector uh, to you know figure out how to help with the challenges of uh, of climate change. And uh, they also have these large sort of looming uh, decommissioning costs associated with their platforms that they're they're facing. And so if they can tell a story about how those platforms could re be repurposed for supporting sort of tidal energy demonstration projects or pilot projects, they're interested in that as well. So that's been a really um, fruitful conversation. Um, and I'm actually gonna be presenting to the Alaska Oil and Gas Association conference later today, um, kind of telling this story as well. Um, and lastly, we've, we've gotten started on some of this work. We've done some resource assessment uh, work just off of the East Foreland there uh, near Nikiski, just within a couple miles of that ammonia plant. Uh, we made transects back and forth across this uh, channel at the East Foreland and deployed three moorings, uh, one bottom lander and two midwater moorings uh, and got two months of data. Uh, and we made sediment and CTD samples um, so got a lot of good data out of that. That was a year ago. Um, and that's it. I'm not, I, I'd be happy to share some of the data with you guys if you're interested, but um, I just wanted to at least make sure I got into the, we, we got to the Q&A portion um, but, uh, before, you know, yeah, I want to make sure we had time to get to Q&A. So that's, that's all for now, I think. Terrific. Thank you very much to Levi for your perspective. This was so very interesting and very nice match up also think with uh, with Till's presentation. Um, I'm pretty sure there are plenty of questions and we have plenty of time for for discussion. Um, so let's get that discussion started. Um, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. And, uh, I, I'll get started real quick. Uh, Levi, can you talk a little bit more about NREL? Um, I, it looks like it's a, a, a Department of Energy uh, facility. It's part of the, the National Laboratory System. That's right. Yeah, so it's the only uh, national lab that's devoted exclusively to renewable energy technology research. You know, a lot of the others, well, NREL included, got started, you know, in the nuclear, um, in the, the nuclear, uh, days. Um, and so, but NREL is the only lab dedicated solely to uh, renewable energy research, but a lot of the, a lot, I think all of the other national labs are now heavily invested in renewable energy research. And um, NREL played a really, I think, key role in both the solar and wind industry. I have a lot of overlap with the people in the, the wind sector at NREL. And, you know, tidal, when, whenever I'm explaining tidal energy to people, you know, I'm always like, tidal energy is basically underwater wind turbines. And my job is to find the locations that have the strongest currents. And um, so we, I'm, I'm like the resource guy, and but I work with a lot of the mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, um, and they leverage a lot of the knowledge and experience from the wind industry um, in, you know, in designing these turbines. And I guess that's also the reason I originally got my start at NREL back in 2011 was they knew that ocean turbulence was a key, or they knew that wind, atmospheric turbulence had been this Thing that they hadn't accounted for early in the wind days and it basically broke all their wind turbines in like the 80s and in the in the 80s time frame and so they had to kind of like learn the hard way the importance of turbulence and so i was hired uh, i did my phd with jonathan nash who's on the call 
um, studying ocean turbulence in the Columbia River. And they hired me basically because I was a turbulence expert. And they're like, we need to get ahead of this turbulence question in the oceans uh, in designing uh, tidal energy devices. Great, very fascinating. Uh, Till, you have, you have a question. Yeah, um, thanks. Very, very interesting talk. Um, I was just, it might be a very stupid question, but um, so you also talked about they're basically just underwater turbines, but is that, does it have to be like that? Is there like, a, like uh, I mean, there's like, I get in my Google feed, I get like these uh, wave energy things that just float on the water and they're movable, or there are different ways to, like, I think back in the day in England, that like basins holding back like tight water and then releasing it afterwards uh, to create energy. Is there like lots of different ideas out there or is the basically everybody focused on, okay, just wind turbines, just smaller and for the water? So we, we have a, a whole nother part of our pro program is focused on wave energy devices. And so that is, you know, that's, but that's, that's like surface waves in the sense of like wind driven surface waves. There's of course the like, the uh, barotropic tidal waves that are propagating around the oceans. Um, and so that is the, we tend to call that like the potential energy resource, like the, the, high, the elevation change of the surface of the ocean due to the tides. And basically the economics of that just don't really pencil out. There's not, you'd have to build just massive platforms. Uh, the, the size of the platform you'd have to build to sort of get that, um, that, the forces you need to generate the amount of energy that you need is is just totally econ uneconomical. Whereas if you design, you know, turbine wind turbines, underwater wind turbines, uh, and you place them in the constrictions of channels where there's a large volume flux from, you know, probably the open ocean to some large basin, uh, that's the that's as far as we've identified. That's sort of the best, most economical way to harness tidal energy at this point. Okay. Milena? Yeah, hi, uh, very nice presentations, thanks. I was, uh, I was just curious and maybe I missed it in your talk, this question is for leave. So I was wondering how, so how big are this? So, so I, I guess you have this underwater turbines, right? And I was just curious to know, you know, how are they, I assume they're more to the bottom, uh, how, you know, how big are these are this facilities? Um, so here, I'll just share my screen again one more time. Um, so the scale of the devices is, is growing, and that's, that's one thing that, oh, um, in the wind industry, it was critical to scale up. Uh, basically, the economies of scale of these devices uh, is what has made wind energy so cheap. And especially like, basically, go, you know, um, the, the going to larger rotors, it's, it's relatively cheap to build a rotor that's twice as big. But of course, the, the energy that you capture goes with the area. So that's a squared. When you make your, your, your blades twice as long, you, get, you capture four times as much energy. So that was a really critical step for um, wind industry. And I think the same is going to be the same for the tidal industry. The challenge, of course, is that uh, there's a depth limit on how, deep, on how deep the ocean is, and especially in these uh, channels where there's this constriction of the flow. Um, uh, you know, a lot of those sites tend to be, de you know, depth limited. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that really runs the gamut of, um, you know, some tidal channels are, you know, 50 meters or less deep. I think, in my opinion, 50 meters, 40 or 50 meters is kind of the cutoff because you want to build those large devices of what would be economical. Um, that you would want sites that are at least 40 or 50 meters deep. Um, in the long term. And I think, but the, another thing that's really important, especially in some of the resource assessment data I presented earlier, is that we're typically looking for currents that are at least a meter per second is sort of our, our cutoff for what we consider to be sort of a viable tidal energy site at this point. But the wind, you know, back in the day, the wind industry had cut, cutoffs for wind speed 
And as time has gone on, they're looking at lower and lower wind speeds um, because they're going to larger and larger rotors. Mm -hmm. And so I do wonder if like, if we can get these rotors to be, you know, a hundred meters in diameter, all of a sudden, does that open up the possibility of, um, of uh, you know, going to lower current sites with lower current speeds, maybe as low as like a half a meter per second or something like that. But that's really for like utility scale electricity generation. There's also this whole sort of PVE markets that I was talking about earlier, where it's like, well, maybe you don't need really high currents um, to generate a small amount of power for like remote applications or science projects or science, uh, you know, moorings or something like that. Um, so that's sort of another area of research of the portfolio that maybe of interest to you guys. Okay, thank you. Very good. Milan, you had another question um, for Till? I had a question for Till, yeah. I was just wondering, because you know, in our climate, uh, uh, in our current modeling group, we have been talking about uh, possibly introducing a tidal energy uh, for for the vertical mixing parameterization, I was just wondering if you think we, you know the atlas could be used to refine the uh, this information for the Arctic. Um, I th the problem is, I mean, the atlas is not. Um, we don't have a gridded data set, right? So okay. we have. Uh, it's quite spotty. So I think the main uh, ability of the atlas is to is to validate models. But not to create data set like in its in its own because yeah we just don't have enough information to grid it. We can okay. only yeah say to modelers check your model at all these different spots and see where it's worse. I see. I see. <laughs> okay, thanks. If I can if I can just jump into that conversation, I would love to talk with you till more about. Um, I think. Even the spotty data that you have, I'd love to. So we have a marine energy atlas that sort of presents all of the tidal energy, re, marine energy resources, waves and tides and everything that the country has. And I think even just saying, even having some points on there, being like, go to the, go to this. Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the name of your guys's atlas. Go to this atlas to get some of this data, or maybe we could visualize the data at those points in sort of a a, a simple way. Um, I think would be of interest to uh, to to the to the Department of Energy. Yeah, yeah, that's let's chat about that. <laughs> uh, maybe you can put the, the link to your um, to your publication in the in the chat too. That might be useful for people. Yeah, I will. I will do that. All right, then, Jonathan. Um, yeah, um, I really appreciated both of your talks, and I guess I had a, a, and the last question sort of linked to what I was thinking about, and, and I guess the question I have mostly for Levi is, you know, as a someone who comes from more of the pure science com community, is there, do you see um, maybe, like, where are the places where we could be most collaborative with you? And like, do you see, like, where are the big, and, and maybe you already mentioned some of these things, but I guess it would be really good to know how we better can integrate sort of the folks from the pure science with the more applied to make the most progress. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the conversation around geoengineering and, increasing interest in the Arctic is like, it's simultaneously like kind of a bad word, right? In in a lot of political circles. And I think the si I get uncomfortable with the, the concept of geoengineering, um, but you know, there's been conversations at DOE of like, oh, could renewable energy be used to, um, you know, cool uh, surface waters in the Arctic and to increase ice, to increase albedo is like just one example. And I don't, I don't have, I'm not an expert in that stuff. You guys are. And so I, um, I should probably do a better job of like reaching out to, I could do a better job. Like, you know, I'm just being introduced to you guys now of like, and maybe this is the right place to have those conversations of being like, okay, guys, what is the state of the science on that question? 
Um, is it just a, you know, I can tell you, you know, maybe how much energy there is available. What can you tell me about, does this even make sense at all from other environmental considerations, types of concerns? Um, uh, and I guess the, other, so that would be like one way to go about it. I mean, the other way to go about it is, you know, if you guys have ideas about specific um, projects or initiatives or in you know geoengineering type of projects that might have a positive impact like i can help circulate those ideas at doe and it there is sort of a ripe it is a ripe time for those conversations to get started i it's one of those things of you know the more that those stories are being told to at at at, at basically in dc to the right people you know eventually those those conversations sort of start to percolate up um, but yeah, I don't know. Is that a good answer to that question? Do you have other ideas? Uh, I specifically don't, but I think others might. I guess I feel like you're saying let's communicate better, right? So let's communicate more. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and also if you guys hear about ideas that are being circulated, for example, that I, albedo idea that I mentioned, and you guys are like, no, that is a mm -hmm. dumb idea, obviously, for this mm -hmm. reason. Like, tell me, I I would, I, you know, um, I, I'd be happy to advocate sort of for the scientific community within the DOE, uh, within the DOE sphere. Awesome, a great discussion. Um, Jen, do you wanna? Yeah, um, I think uh, uh, all the folks uh, at Alaska region, for some reason, I didn't see anybody have participated. They probably have uh, are more in touch with this topic than I am, but we do have some like, uh, this is, uh, yeah, first I want to say to you and uh, Levi, this, the, you, you uh, have a very great presentations, very interesting topics. So, um, Levi mentioned something about ice characterization in the Cook Inlet. I think uh, Outboom might have some upcoming studies on that topic because they are going to update some of these old ice characterization uh, studies in the past, we did in the past, because some people saw the Cook Inlet, they don't have ice, that's not uh, true. <laughs> yeah, ice definitely is a factor um, because our folks from Alaska region, they didn't participate. Maybe it's my fault. I <laughs> didn't. I thought they are on this IRPIC. Um, I didn't specifically send this invitation to them. Maybe they have uh, some more important meeting. I, I didn't see anybody <laughs> from Alaska region attend. They might have some other um, meetings that has scheduled conflict. So the other thing is that we have some studies, a feasibility study for renewable energy in Alaska offshore uh, water. So, so we have some uh, really, um, they really push, um, Push this topic, um, push this type of study in the Cook Inlet for our agency. But I'm not the person who's directly manages this type of study. So, but I'm aware of it. We have some push, and uh, um, quite a few studies are in collaboration with NREL and uh, PNNL. So, just to let you know that we are a boom is from more practical point of view because we are going to do environmental impact statement, monitor all this. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to do any, um, even pilot project, you have to do this environmental impact statement just to do, uh, I think, getting the permit, I think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we've got a bunch of work with, um, we've got a project right now where we're quantifying the marine energy resources of Alaska including offshore wind for BOEM right now. Maybe that's one of the projects that you mentioned. I've also spoken with Hayo Aiken, um, who I assume all of you guys know is sort of a part yeah. of the community about sea ice, ice characterization in Cook Inlet. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, basically, I've been trying to figure, maybe there's an opportunity also to, you know, if, if BOEM's putting some money into this ice characterization work in Cook Inlet, Maybe DOE would, you know, so far I've been unsuccessful in convincing them that they should do that, but maybe if someone else is doing it, they'd be happy to contribute. Yeah, um, our colleague keep uh, telling us, you know, DOE has 
lots of money <laughs> than bomb. So <laughs> yeah, maybe DOE can contribute more to <laughs> DOE has lots of money. The marine energy program is still relatively small, though. Oh, OK. And I do just want to note that it looks like there are um, at least one person from the Alaska BOEM office, Albert, and then Maya Lucan is from the uh, DOI National Park Service in Alaska. Oh, OK. Uh, sorry, because, um, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're nearing the top of the hour. Um, if there's any other questions people want to want to ask, um, and if not, then um, I mean, do you feel free to reach out to Levi and to Till. Um, no pressing questions. Well, then maybe we should um, we should conclude the meeting here. I'm very pleased with these presentations and the discussion, um, making these connections. That's the that's the the, the role of IARPIC or the, the goal of IARPIC. Um, so thank you, Levi. Thank you, Till. Uh, thank you all to the, the participants here and the people who participated in the discussion. Uh, thanks to Meredith for uh, putting everything together. And um, we'll conclude here, and um, we'll send uh, additional announcements for future uh, physical oceanography team uh, meetings. Uh, Meredith, do you want to uh, have anything else to announce? Or we... Just a notice that this um, recording will be posted probably by the end of the day today. So, Jen, if you want to send that to your colleagues in the Alaska office, if they had another meeting, that's an option, or anyone, um, feel free to use that recording. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.